What happens when someone comes to you and says, here's a period film? What goes through your head? Um, with this film, uh, I must say, I think I sought it because I knew the story. I had read a book about Effie Gray, and I, the period of art is something that I'm very, very passionate about. It's a period I know very well. I come from Manchester, and um, the Manchester Art Gallery has an enormous amount of, um, of uh, pre-Raphaelite and, and uh, late Victorian paintings. So it was something that I really wanted to do, and I really wanted to do it in a specific way. Do you go to the character first or to the period when you have such an assignment? Well, um, I knew the period, uh, but you really go to the character first. I mean, I'm a great believer that this job, my job, my wonderful job, is about storytelling more than anything else. And if you lose that, you don't get the same sort of texture. We were speaking just a bit before we came up about the difference between doing costumes for stage and costumes for film. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, I started in the theatre, and I, I, all my, I mean, since being a very young child, all I wanted to do was work in the theatre. But the moment that I walked onto a film set, I knew that I, I had no... Uh, the thing about films is you can tell secrets, and you can tell secrets in all sorts of ways. You can help with the character, you can expand, you can go into, you can minimize things that... So it's a much, much more exquisite medium for someone like me. You can still do your big strokes. I mean, there are lots of big strokes in this, but you also get to do all the private little moments. So there's a close-up of a cuff, for example, that exactly. would have an intimacy yes. that a stage, uh, even the same piece of clothing on stage, would not carry over. That's right, so. yeah. And, and for this film in particular, where did you begin to look? Because the past to us is a black and white existence. Where do, where do you look for the authenticity of color and texture? Well, in this film, I looked at the paintings, mm -hmm. um, and they're rich, and they're vital. Uh, someone asked me the other day how accurate the costumes were, and I said, not incredibly accurate, and they were confused. But where they weren't accurate, which was that I did try and use the paintings as reference rather than real costumes. Victorian costumes are heavy, and they are um, they're wonderful but they are pretty determined in themselves, and they move in a pretty... They, they move, could stand upright by themselves. Yeah, they move like motor cars, slow motor cars. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, what I tried to do was, was give it some sense of the lyricism. So I did use very different underpinnings. Uh, I was very careful in fabrics. We sprayed into fabrics, so we got a lot of the sense of depth. It was a very, very fun job. Do you get to insist that the actors wear the same undergarments that they would in these period costumes as well? Yes, and if you're a hero like Dakota Fanning, you allow yourself to be put into a corset and have your waist pulled into 21 inches. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Without complaining. Really? Which, uh, That's a trooper. Which, that is a trooper. She is a very, very wonderful girl. For costuming her character in particular, the transition from young girl to bride and then bride to wife who wasn't a wife, you still had a sense of, of her virginal state throughout. How did you develop that and evolve it? Um, it's a lovely story, her story. It's a lovely journey, and, and um, visually it's a lovely journey because she starts off as this very young, uh, inexperienced, innocent girl in Scotland when she first comes to London, I think there's a real feeling that she is unsuitable in London. And in fact, there's a cut which so uh, you, you don't get when she comes downstairs in the pink dress and they send her back to, to um, put on a rather gloomy green dress that she then goes to the dinner in. So she comes not knowing her way around. She then becomes more and more repressed by what's going on um, and more and more unhappy, which I think you know, I hope you see in the costumes, you see her going more and more into herself. The necks get higher, the, um, they get heavier. Uh, and then she hits Venice. And she hits Venice like we all hit Venice. And she hits the shops, she hits uh, the lives. She goes, ooh, ooh, this is it. And you see her completely flower in Venice as a person. Um, emotionally, she's still having a terrible time. But you see her taking control of herself as a person. Then she comes back, and it's even worse. 
she then goes to Scotland, which is where her heart is. So in Scotland, the clothes very much were of organically involved with the countryside, which she knew. Much simpler, she, too, they yeah. seemed. Uh, interestingly, or interestingly for me, uh, uh, Millet did a lot, a lot of drawings of her in Scotland. So there was a lot of lovely line drawings that it was possible to use as reference, which was a big treat and not a usual thing. Uh, then she comes back from Scotland and things have gone from bad to worse, except she has a, what she knows. She's in a chrysalis state. So in all the clothes that she wears after Scotland, you see a little touch of what's going to come out. When she's at the lawyer, she has this very stern seriously heavy Victorian outfit, but she has a fluffy little jabot at her. And what I was trying to do was give that sense of... I mean, it was storytelling. Um, and, of course, the sort of cape at the end, which is alive, uh, you know, the idea was that the colour and the movement of it, you would feel that life was really breaking through and it was like the sun coming out. Like the scene of her spinning in the piazza. That was nice. In yeah. Venice, which was yeah. lovely. Yes. And uh, also, traditionally, once you got married in Victorian England, you wore your hair up. But her hair was down like a young woman's mm. for a long time. I, Did think, that... I think she was young, and I, I think he would have hated her to have had her hair up. Oh, yeah. so this was yet more of his dictates. You got the sense that he was, of yes. course, very controlling about yes. everything. Yes, yes. And, uh, and for him, with his blue um, ascot, his, uh, his, his neck, neck scarf the whole time, here's a man who had an immense influence on the aesthetic of the 19th century, and yet I don't think I would have liked him very much at all. I don't know that many people liked him <laughs> very much at all. Did you well, have to hugely convey? Hugely important. Yes. Uh, to the art world, hugely, yeah. Can, let's put this a little closer. If you oh, want. yes. Sorry. Um, so how did you convey, apart from the consistency of that blue scarf, how did you convey his well, sense Well, it is of conservative, too. You do get a sense that he is a man who is trapped, also trapped in his own body. And that, I uh, hope, the costume somehow helped that. And the fact that he really didn't change. He just, and he did have a lot of the same costume. We did, in fact make him a lot of the same costume because it seemed like a good idea that we should feel that, that he was always changing from one costume to the same costume to the same costume. And he had that sense of rigidity about him. Uh, the, uh, the character played by Julie Walters, his mother, uh, there's a phrase in England, which we should actually learn here in Beverly Hills, called mutton dressed as lamb, which is older women dressing far too young. And I got the sense that she was seducing her son still, and the clothes were just a little bit too young, maybe a little bit too daring yes, for her. Yes, actually, it made me laugh. I, I suddenly remembered when you were talking about corsets that the only person who did complain about her corset was Julie. And I think that was part of the character, <laughs> that this character is sort of trying to pull herself into this. But, you know, she's, she's got a lovely, round, womanly figure. And um, that she somehow um, was trying to um, avoid. I thought of Mary Todd Lincoln when I... Yeah, saw her yeah, carrying yeah, along yeah. like a great yeah, ship I mean, under she does sail. Look like a sofa. I mean, she does look as though she's upholstered and, you know, padded out and something you could possibly sit on. But she, her character was so flirtatious with mm. her son that I looked, I saw that in the costuming as well. Mm. And that was a reality too. She did go to Oxford with him. <laughs> when people, you know, when all our children at 18 go up on their own, she did go. My goodness. Mm. And no wonder the scene with the shirts, like, don't touch yeah, his yeah. shirts. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. And, and what about the Emma Thompson character? There was something almost 18th century about the way she was dressing. What did you want to convey with that? Oh, well, I thought it that? was more 20th century, but maybe... Well, it was no, but I saw the Duchess of Devonshire in yeah. her well, hair. I, in her. Yes, I just wanted her to be her own person, and I really wanted with her because of who she is, is to the piece and because of the sort of life that Emma has. I wanted you to feel that she wasn't a conventional Victorian person, that she wasn't one of it, that she was a wife with real spirit. I mean, she really is the conduit that gets Effie into who she is. She might never have done it without her. So I did not want you to feel that this was a conventional woman. I wanted you to feel that this was a woman with great flair and her own sense of artistry and her own sense of who she was in the world. 